Good evening, everybody. Um, it seems that most of the people have joined the webinar, so we are going to get started. I am Dr. Kristen Trebona. I'm the Director of Education for the Hawthorne Public Schools, and we are excited that you are all here joining us for the first of many of our parent workshop series this school year. So um, this is one of our first events for the 2021-2022 school year, and we're very excited. Um, the district has put together, as you saw in this flyer, um, this first th series of three mental health workshops for transitioning back to school and working with um, our children as we um, embark on the new yet unusual school year. Um, but moving forward, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Weger, the Director of School Counseling, in a minute. Um, we have a lot of different parent workshops this school year that we are excited um, on various topics from social emotional, um, academic well-being, um, mindfulness, and um, more. Most of our flyers will begin coming out in September. So um, as we have been doing, we will be blasting these moving forward. At this time, I want to turn it over to Mrs. Weger and thank you for coming. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christine Weiger, and I am the Director of School Counseling here in Hawthorne. Thank you, Dr. Trevona. We're really excited that you have decided to join us tonight for our first workshop in our Let's Talk Mental Health series. Um, tonight's focus is really just to talk about the transition back to school, what our students have gone through and experienced over the course of the past year and a half, um, some of the challenges they have faced, as well as some of the successes. And Within that tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the feelings and the emotions they might be feeling, you know, anticipating the return back to what we are hoping and venturing to be a more normalized school year. Um, and, you know, we will dive a little bit into some of the mental health that we have been seeing with our students and really, most importantly, some of the strategies and skills as parents uh, that you can utilize at home as we transition back. As Dr. Trebona had mentioned as well, too, this is the first First workshop out of a series of workshops that we have um, over the course of the upcoming school year. Please keep in mind, uh, we will have a second workshop. It's scheduled for this Thursday where we will be discussing the universal mental health screener. Um, that's something that we are going to be utilizing with our middle school and high school students. So please middle school and high school parents uh, join us for Thursday's presentation as well. Um, this year we partnered with West Bergen Mental Health and we have two counselors that are going to be working with us over the course of the year in our middle school and our high school. They also will be providing some support to our elementary schools as well too. Um, and they're really just going to be with us to provide as much support to our students and our families as much as we can over the course of this year. So with us tonight um, and presenting our presentation tonight, we have Mr. Leland Newman who is our high school counselor, as well as uh, Ms. Jesse Bader, who will be working with our middle school population. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse and Leland so they can start our program. And again, thank you for joining us. This will be on our website following the presentation, both the recording and the slides, and you can utilize the question and answer box if you have any questions throughout the presentation. Jesse and Leland, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, we are going to be talking about the first series of the Let's Talk Mental Health. Um, Leland and I are both really excited to be working in the Hawthorne District um, and really excited to start off this workshop. So um, we're going to get started then. All right. So as I said, welcome to our presentation, Let's Talk Mental Health. Um, we work with West Bergen um, and we will be in the Hawthorne School District to provide support to all of the students during this challenging transition back into in-person learning. Um, today we're going to be discussing a variety of topics related to mental health in schools. Um, as you guys know, and as it was evident, it was incredibly challenging last year. Um, we see that, the school saw that, and you know we're just hoping to provide the parent support. We're uh, really excited to provide the students support and hopefully make this a, a much easier year for all involved. Um, we're going to be discussing school related issues, mental health, and the return to in person learning post COVID. All right, so I'm going to be starting off with our first uh, topic, which is school related problems. Sorry. 
All right, so a couple of problems that we've been seeing are specifically related to problematic absenteeism. So I want to go over um, some of those topics with you. Leland, if you could just pop back. There we go. All right, so school phobia is um, essentially fear-based absenteeism, school refusals or anxiety-based absenteeism. Um, school withdrawal would be a parent motivated absenteeism and then truancy would be illegal absences from school or unexcused absence without parental knowledge. So I'm going to go over a couple of these different terms with you, um, but if you have any questions as I'm going through, feel free to um, put them in the uh, Q&A section. All right, so as I said, I'm going to be talking about some of these topics. My first one is going to be school refusal. All right, so I wanted to start off with a poem um, that is a little bit lighthearted, but definitely talks about the topic a lot. It's called I Cannot Go to School Today by Shel Silverstein. Um, I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. I have the measles and the mumps, a gash, a rash, and purple mumps. My mouth is wet, my mouth is dry. My, I'm going blind in my right eye. My tonsils are as big as rocks. I've counted 16 chicken pox. And there's one more that's 17. And don't you think my face looks green? My leg is cut, my eyes are blue. It might be the instamatic flu. I cough and sneeze and gasp and choke. I'm sure that my left leg is broke. And my back is wrenched, my ankle is sprained, my appendix pains each time it rains. My toes are cold, my toes are numb. I have a silver in my thumb. My neck is stiff, my voice is weak. I hardly whisper when I speak. My tongue is filling at my mouth. I think my hair is falling out. My elbows bent, my spine ain't straight. My temperature is 108. My brain is shrunk, I cannot hear. There's a hole inside my ear. I have a hangnail and my heart is, what, what's that, what's that you say? Today is Saturday, goodbye, I'm out to play. Um, so as I said, just kind of lighthearted, right? But the idea being, it's school that is the issue. There's a problem associated with it. And when school is taken out of the equation, right, we don't see those similar behaviors anymore. So that's something I kind of want to get into a little bit more with you guys tonight. All right, so school refusal behaviors, the definition is it's a child motivated refusal to attend school and or difficulties remaining in class for an entire day. This is not a psychological diagnosis um, and 28% of school age children in America refuse school during some point of their education. Um, I would think after the pandemic and with the different challenges children were presented, this is probably a much higher percentage um, and one that we definitely have to be more on the lookout for because it really was such a difficult um, issue that we were faced last year as a school district. Um, the prevalence is definitely higher than major behavior childhood disorders such as depression or ADHD. All right, so some of the characteristics of school refusal. Um, so this we're seeing all across the board. This is affecting children of all socioeconomic statuses, all races, all genders. Um, you know, it really is something that all children at some point attempt to review school. Um, and when it goes unnoticed, it's something that we're seeing way more prevalently. So um, right now it's more prevalent among young adolescents and students entering a new school building for the first time. We're seeing it from elementary school to middle school and middle school to high school. Um, intelligence and academic achievement does not seem to predict school refusal. Um, and the risks are that children often exhibit attendance problems for at least one to two years before they're receiving treatment. So our goal in giving this presentation is when you're seeing some of these risks, um, just the ability to identify them and then for us to be able to work on them together um, and just ensure that the risks don't get out of hand um, or continue any further than they need to. Um, increased risk would be anxiety, depression, conduct and oppositional disorders and medical illnesses. So the different degrees of school refusal, um, there's the initial, which is very briefly and may resolve without intervention, um, substantial, and it occurs for a minimum of two weeks 
So when we're seeing something at this um, level, this is kind of where we want to attack it initially. So being able to talk to them at this point and saying kind of what is the root of this issue and how can we kind of start intervening so that we can make sure it doesn't get to the next two levels, which are acute lasting two weeks to one year being a consistent problem for the majority of that time. And then chronic would interfere with two or more academic years and cases lasting more than one calendar year. Um, so just with this idea, right, when we see the different degrees of that school refusal, we want to reach out at that point, get some help and some assistance, um, and be able to make sure that we have an intervention in place for that specific student. So assessments. So before we can begin to effectively intervene with school refusal behavior, as I said before, we have to discuss why the student is refusing to come to school. This may be something we can talk to the teachers about and see if something maybe took place and it's an isolated incident. That's probably where we would see the initial or the acute cases. Um, something that has more of a deeper root would be something that we would want to address a little bit further and it may need some outpatient providers or myself or Leland to kind of intervene and provide that level of support to parents as well as to the student. Um, and in order to pick the right per, uh, intervention, we do need to figure out what that issue is so that we can make sure that it doesn't continue any further. So different issues to assess for each individual child would be their temperament, their self-esteem, their social status, their physical status, if they've experienced any bullying, any cognitive abilities, learning disorders, communication skills, any traumatic life events that we've seen more recent, um, relationship with their parents, the marital status of parents, parenting style, parents of conflict, um, family, mental, or physical illness. So any of these would be things that I would probably initially want to assess and know what was the impact on that child. Um, and that would just kind of be something I would talk to teachers about, I would talk to the parents about, and ultimately would want to sit down, build a rapport with that student, and then be able to assess from there. So how to assess. So the parents, school, and or therapist need to be helping the student explain why he or she is missing school, as we stated earlier. Um, you know, we would talk to the teachers, what have you observed in class, and what do the parents observe at home. Um, we want to help the student understand if they're cooperative with the assessment process. Everyone will be um, doing their best to help address the issues raised. If not, if the student is non-cooperative, we do really want to let them know that then the adults will be making the decision, right? We want to empower them and help them to advocate for themselves and to take control of the situation. Um, but we want to let them know that a decision is going to be made either way. Um, so as I said, you know, it's really important to get a whole team approach when it comes to these situations and to provide as much support as we possibly can. All right. On to the next slide, Leland. So the functional model of school refusal behavior. Um, so the function would be what maintains a child's behaviors and what motivates a child to refuse school. So some of the things that we're seeing are one would be to avoid general school related situations that cause distress or provoke negative feelings. Two would be to avoid or escape peer interactions and or academic performance situations at school. Um, oh, can you go back one Leland? So if we're avoiding, you know, escaping peer interactions or academic performance situations, this is something I'm typically seeing a lot with students from last year is it was really difficult to catch up. And once the school was continuing and then the work was getting more difficult and the year was going on, those overwhelming feelings, those feelings of anxiety that kicked in really hard and it was difficult for the student to see a way out, right, for them to feel like they were going to get enough support or be able to catch up. So my goal really would be to kind of assess what led to them being brought back a little bit and then help them to be able to catch back up with the rest of their class. Um, and then three would be to receive attention from significant others outside of school, such as parents. And then four is to receive or pursue tangible rewards outside of school. So tangible rewards could be, you know, the ability to play video games, the food is a lot better at home, you know, spending time with mom or dad, um, maybe their siblings are home, right? So there's some kind of reward that, you know, they're getting from being at home that they're not getting when they're at school. You know, maybe grandma and grandpa live there and grandma and grandpa are fun and they buy them candy. You know, the idea being they get that alone time and it's a reward for them. So we want to figure out what is keeping these behaviors to continue and then what's motivating them to refuse school, whatever that may be, that'll help us in our assessment. Um, and then the next couple of slides I have just kind of explain that a little bit further. So um, if you want to go back and look at them, I am going to skip over them for the uh, sake of time. 
um, but they just kind of explain each one of those four points uh, a little bit more clearly. Yeah, avoiding general school related stress, uh, escape from adverse social and or evaluative situations, pursuit of attention from significant others, and pursuit of tangible rewards outside of school. So now we're going to get into talking a little bit about social phobia. All right, so signs and symptoms of social phobia. So anxiousness about being with other people and have a hard time talking to them, even though they wish they could. So these students who are struggling with social phobia, they want to interact, they want to socialize, and they don't always know the reason why it is that they're struggling so much or having a hard time. After COVID, where these students were not interacting, where they did not have that one-on-one -on -one with their teachers anymore, we were seeing a lot of social phobia, that difficulty to interact. And I think coming into the school year, we're going to see a little bit of that anxiety and that anxiousness, and it's going to be important to target those students and provide them support in those interactions. So these students may feel very self-conscious in front of other people and feel embarrassed and being very afraid that other people will judge them, worrying for days or weeks before an event where other people will be, staying away from places where there are other people, has a hard time making friends and keeping friends. Um, some signs of that would be blushing, sweating, or trembling around other people and feeling nauseous or sick to their stomach with other people. So if this is something that a teacher were to see or if this is something another student or a parent, you know, this would help us to see these are some anxieties that they're starting to experience specifically in a social interaction. Um, and we wanna be able to be there, provide them that support and kind of work on that anxiety. All right, so some indicators in school would be that they're shy, hesitant, make inconspicuous seating choices, poor eye contact, be on the fringe of the group, frequent requests to go to the nurse, right? So doing anything they can to avoid these social interactions that are really difficult and that may even lead to them having some of those indicators, right, where their face is turning red, they're trembling, right? They feel all of that and they know that they're exhibiting it. And the idea being that that's just adding to the anxiety and increasing it. So things that they may avoid would be the cafeteria, participating in gym, raising their hand in class, going to the blackboard, asking the teacher a question, speaking to school personnel, giving oral reports, and participating in extracurriculars. So one of the biggest things that we may see this year specifically is now these interactions with teachers that were very, very different last year, um, especially if they were negative last year, right? So a lot of students aren't wanting to turn on their cameras. Maybe there were some different aspects that went on where, you know, they weren't attending, and now they have to come back into school and see those people again, it could lead to some anxiety. And, you know, there's a different level of understanding that we have for these students with social phobia, because now they're going to have an even more difficult time attending school. And it may then lead to even further than that, some of the school refusal behaviors that we're a little bit um, more uh, aware of this year. All right, so ways that we can support is my next topic. So we want to maintain a school schedule. So if we have a student that's experiencing school phobia, if they're experiencing school refusal, any of the behaviors we talked about at the beginning, um, if the student is staying home, right, they should not have access to anything they wouldn't be allowed to access in school. This would be their cell phone, a TV, video games, et cetera. Um, during school hours, the student should still be doing academic work. So obviously this would be if the student, you know, didn't have some ailment that was preventing them. But let's say we're seeing a student who's starting to show some signs of school refusal or is showing a signs of a school phobia, right? So we want to kind of maintain that consistency at home um, that they would still have at school so we can increase and encourage the school attendance. Um, lunch and break time should happen at the same time they would in school. And food options at home should be as similar to school as So common mistakes in addressing school refusal behaviors. So recognizing and intervening too late in the process, as I said, we'd wanna get them to that initial or acute level uh, stage and allowing the child to go home from school unexpectedly early for a non-medical reason. We wanna keep them in the school to kind of address the places that they're most uncomfortable and provide them support while they're there. Um, a changing and agreed upon plan too quickly due to lack of immediate consistent results. Truth is, is we're not gonna see immediate consistent results. We want to keep with the plan, maintain consistency, and then see how the student reacts from that. Um, we don't want to prioritize academic success before their emotional health. So we want to make sure that these students are safe when they're in school, that their thoughts are safe, and that they're emotionally feeling like they're well. 
And if they're not, then we wanna target those issues and provide them that support again. Um, any lack of coordination of care when transitioning from elementary school to middle school or middle school to high school. So I would urge you parents, if you have a child who struggled last year in elementary school, or you have any concerns about them interacting in a new environment, you know, Leland and I are here and we're here specifically so we can provide those supports for that transition. You know, we still have a few weeks left and if we're gonna potentially see some school refusal at the beginning, we'd like to target that now during the summer and provide that support. Um, also lack of coordination of care with outside providers. I always urge parents, the best thing that you can do is if you're starting to see these symptoms, your child, it's not too young for them to see a therapist. It's not too early for you to contact your pediatrician you know, getting these children that support, they see it's serious and they see that you care. Um, you know, so if you have any questions about that, you can always reach out to us as well. So um, my last topic is on building resiliency. Um, so I think that this is really important and it's definitely a way that we can start to support our students a little bit more. All right, so resilience. Resilience is being able to bounce back from difficult times, setbacks, and other significant challenges. It includes being able to deal effectively with pressure and get through tough times with good outcomes. So obviously the pandemic, um, you know, it's not something that we were expecting. It's not something that we could have just thrown the students in and expected great outcomes from them, but we wanna encourage their ability, uh, ability to be resilient and to bounce back from these difficult times setbacks, if your student was retained last year, if your student showed a lot of school refusal and just made it by the hair of their teeth, right? The idea being that we want to help them to effectively deal with that pressure and get through that and then have a good outcome for this year. This is a brand new year. However it is that COVID impacts it, right? We're crossing our fingers that we don't see it again, but we want to provide them that support. So when children are resilient, they're braver, they're more curious, they're more adaptable, and they're more able to extend their reach into the world. So adaptable is my key word there. I want your children to be more resilient because I want them to be more adaptable. I want them to thrive in the future. All right, so one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit is different kinds of parenting that we're seeing, right, when it comes to these different behaviors. So conscious parenting, so being aware of the impact that the way you're parenting is impacting the children and can benefit them in the long run, right? So reacting is a quick approach based mostly on our own strong feelings that typically leads parents to protect, rescue, and diminish emotional growth in their children. So it's not something that it's intended, right? It's our own strong emotions. We want our child to be safe. We want to keep them in a bubble. We don't want them to experience anything difficult or hardship, but we end up rescuing them. And then we're not allowing them to grow on their own. So another way that we would want to respond is we want to respond. So it's a thoughtful, mindful approach and typically leads parents to nurture, teach, and support emotional growth in their children, right? So if I'm trying to build resiliency in my child, I don't wanna to react to what it is that they're telling me or react to something that they're having. I wanna respond. I wanna think about what it is that they're going through and I wanna be conscious to how difficult it must be and instead validate their emotions, validate how they're feeling. So. The next thing I have in here is let them fail, let them feel. So it's by Dan Kimon, who's a child psychologist and Harvard lecturer. He states, it's like the way our body's immune system develops, he explained. You have to be exposed to pathogens or your body won't know how to respond to an attack. Kids also need exposure to discomfort, failure, and struggle. Civilization is about adapting to less than perfect situations, yet parents often have this instantaneous reaction to unpleasantness, which is, I can fix this. All right, so we want to support our child's problem solving skills. We want to listen, listen, and listen, right? I want to hear what they're saying. I want to know how they're feeling. I don't want to jump in. I don't want to tell them how they're feeling. And I want to ask how questions instead of why questions, right? So why are you feeling this way? How did this make you feel? How did this situation impact you? How are you working on solving the problem, right? I want to empower them. And then I want to reframe and expand the problem. So I want to foster optimism. I want to reframe their problem and make it as optimistic as I can, right? I want to role model perspective taking, and I want to validate their emotions versus validating their perceptions. 
their perception may be, you know, this student doesn't like me or this teacher doesn't like me. Instead, I want to validate their emotion and say, how does it make you feel when you interact with this student? How does it make you feel when you interact with this teacher, right? How can we make this a better situation for you? All right, so we wanna provide support and guidance. So resilience means relationships, not complete independence. Um, so we still need that support and social support associated with positive emotions, sense of control, self-esteem and optimism. We wanna use praise, we wanna praise them when we see them doing well. We wanna praise them when they're talking about their emotions, when they come to you for help. And we wanna talk about the idea of becoming and we wanna build their narrative so that they have their own ability to advocate and talk about themselves and be able to identify how it is that they're feeling and what they're going through. I'm sorry, I think there is a lag. All right, so last but not least, we wanna reflect. So this is what I mean about conscious parenting, right? So is what I'm doing right now helping to raise a resilient adult? These are some good questions to ask. How do your kids respond to failure right now? How am I seeing my kid when he loses a sport, when he's not doing well in school? How am I seeing him react to that failure? What is their attitude towards difficult situations where the outcome may not be in their favor? Does your child have an empowering narrative and how can you help them to expand it? Are you a good listener? Are you modeling good listening for your kids, right? And do your kids effectively communicate their needs to you and ask for help when they need it? Because if they can do that with you, the most trusted adult that they have, then we're empowering them to be able to do that with other adults that they start to feel that same trust and connection with. Um, thank you so much. And we're gonna move on to Leland's portion of the uh, presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, I apologize, everybody. There might be a slight delay. My computer, which is the present presentator, uh, is just a little bit behind. Um, so I'm going to do my best to give a little bit of space between slides, just so that everybody um, can catch up if I am a little bit ahead. So like Jesse uh, was saying, you know, my topic is a little bit more towards the mental health side of things. Um, and this year, more than any year, it's a very important topic for discussion. Uh, the pandemic obviously caused many disruptions to the lives of everybody, um, and many people are still recovering from that. Schools were obviously some of the most impacted sectors of our society. Uh, with a return to in-person learning coming in a few weeks, it's going to be helpful for all of us to review some information on what mental health issues are, some common issues that are faced by school children, and how to, help, how to best help your child to get through some of these issues. So, a little note uh, before we kind of continue into the discussion on mental health, uh, I want to make a clear distinction on something that is used to clarify and classify uh, mental disorders in, in life. Um, we use the term disorders, but it, I don't want to necessarily think about it that way. So when you look at the words mental, it's mind, dis, having a negative connotation, order, an arrangement of things in relation to others. So as we discuss these topics, I hope to remind you that although your child may suffer from symptoms or a diagnosis of a mental disorder, that does not mean that there's necessarily anything wrong with them. It simply means their mind is ordered in a different way than most, that they may process, think, or feel in a different way because of those small differences in how they are ordered, and that you as a parent are responsible for understanding that their experiences might be a little bit different and helping them to kind of guide them through that, that, that section and that difficulty in life. So the first mental disorder I wanna talk about is anxiety. Uh, it's a very common thing. This is probably something that most people have experienced, especially in the last year. So anxiety typically manifests as a feeling of worry, concern, stress, or nervousness about a specific incident. Every person, no matter what their mental status, at some point in their life has experienced anxiety. It is how we respond to these feelings that, are, that determine our ability to cope. Now, one in eight children aged nine to 17 experience some form of anxiety that is significant. And that's exactly why we're having this conversation now. 
is maybe your child does have anxiety. Maybe they've shared with you that they have some anxiety about the upcoming school year, but odds are at some point in the last year and a half of the pandemic, they've experienced some form of anxiety. But when does it become a disorder? It becomes a disorder when it's disproportionate to the event. It is disruptive to a person's life across a few different domains in family and social, uh, in work or school. It is distressing to a point that they cannot handle. And the duration is longer than any typical anxiety. So I'm going to briefly kind of discuss a few of the most common anxiety disorders um, and just some brief, you know, kind of recommendations for how to manage and how to help with these. There are a lot of different anxiety order disorders outside of these three, but this is just a good general summation. Um, for your own knowledge, if you begin to kind of hear about some of these things, if your child becomes you know, working with a therapist, knowing some of these terms and, and some of the disorders and what they're named and what, how they're categorized might make you feel a little bit more comfortable with the process if it is something that you have to do. So generalized anxiety disorder or GAD for short uh, is uncontrollable worry and rumination over day-to-day -day situations, both trivial and major. Uh, it's usually, it's, it's associated with the following symptoms, nervousness, restless, fatigue, poor concentration, motor restlessness, so kind of agitation, maybe you're tapping your foot, uh, a need for reassurance, approval seeking, nausea, headaches, stomach pains, and general body aches, um, frequent vis visits to the nurse or doctor, and a, a high degree of perfectionism. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder is not necessarily from a specific incident or a traumatic event or something like that. It's kind of something that just throughout a day-to-day -day experience, a person might have anxiety across, you know, a variety of different things. So they might have anxiety about their, their morning and their, the meeting they have in the afternoon and what they're going to do with their family in the evening. So this is a little bit more generalized uh, as we continue on. I'm just going to take a break to catch up. As you'll see, something like a panic disorder is usually brought on by a little bit more specific sort of scenarios. So panic disorders are characterized by acute incidents of panic attacks. Uh, the panic attack is a very common term um, that is used throughout our society to, 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 to dictate a lot of different things. But a panic attack in this setting is very specific. It's a very specific kind of physical and mental reaction and that are caused by some sort of precipitating event. Now, this can be internal. Uh, a thought or emotion that your child or yourself is having, or this could be due to external events, uh, world events, or maybe a, a crisis weather event that happens that can cause panic and dismay. So some of the symptoms that you would see of somebody having a panic attack are things like palpitations. Um, you might not see that as much. That's oftentimes when people go to the hospital or the e emergency room with heart palpitations, Many of the time, it is just a panic attack that they've never experienced before. So some of these symptoms can be very discom discomforting and very, very aggressive. So palpitations, sweating, uh, trembling, a shortness of breath, or like a feeling of choking and not being able to catch one's breath. The, the classic uh, motif I think you see a lot in films is, you know, grabbing the paper bag and breathing into it. Um, nauseous, nausea and stomach ache dizziness, derealization or depersonalization, fear of losing control or dying, and chills or hot flashes. Some of these panic attack symptoms, like I was saying, the stomach pain, heart palpitations, uh, gasping for air, these can mimic other medical disorders. And like I said, it could end up, people end up going to the emergency room for these kind of things. But if we can together kind of identify you know, is this necessary? Is this a medical issue or is this, you know, more of a panic issue? We might be able to prevent another trip to the ER, which is always good. Social anxiety disorder. Um, Jesse touched on this a little bit um, or quite a, quite a good deal, but this is a little bit more in relation to kind of school stuff. So an intense fear, concern, worry, or rumination about specific social scenarios. So maybe you're concerned about having conversations or opening doors or ordering food in a restaurant or through a drive-through. Um, 
that worry or rumination is usually associated with a belief that the individual's performance is going to somehow result in being judged. So what I say in a conversation, people are going to hate me for it, or they're going to think that I'm a dork or something like that. So some other symptoms may include that the social scenario always invokes fear or anxiety. So if you occasionally get fear or anxiety just because you're ordering food or having a difficult conversation, it might not be social anxiety disorder or it might be a challenging conversation. But if every time you're going to have a conversation or every time you're going to order something on the phone, you're having this, this fear or anxiety, that might be something to take a deeper look at. Um, disproportionate level of anxiety to the situation. Uh, avoiding scenarios or location where socializing may occur. Um, in school, what this looks like is a student might be shy, they might be hesitant, they might make inconspicuous seating choices, poor eye contact. These are all the same things that Jesse had stated earlier. So how can we help? Um, you as parents are here at this presentation to get information and get some some tips and suggestions on how to help your students. And we wanna be able to help provide that. A very important thing with anxiety is patience. It's a, anxiety is a very difficult emotion for people to process. Um, sometimes there is a, really, a reason for feeling it. Sometimes there is not a very clear reason. So do not always expect that your child will automatically understand the way they feel or know what it is they need to feel better. They might not know and it might take them some time to figure that out. Communication is very important as well. Asking clear questions. When somebody's having a panic attack or is experiencing a high level of anxiety, there might be also some difficulty concentrating and, and thinking clearly. So if you're asking clear questions to your child when they're having a difficult, anxious moment, they might be able to better respond to you if you were to give kind of unsure or unclear questions. Uh, help define the issues, explore what may be bothering them, try and help them to figure out, like Jesse was saying before, you're, you, that you guys know your children, but in order to help them figure some of this stuff out, they might need their best trusted adult. Um, and support, be supportive. If your child asks to process alone, provide that. If they say, you know, mom, I don't want to talk about that right now. I'm just going to go into my room. If they are, or if safety is not an issue with your child, um, give them that time, treat them like an adult and allow them the opportunity to manage their own emotions. If they can, if they can't, they will come to you and they will ask for the support. But when they are struggling and ask for the time alone, if they are safe, they will be able to build resilience through that way of getting themselves through it. Right? So also create opportunities for supportive communication I'll talk a little bit later about some, you know, just general preventative measures, but supportive communication, you're going to hear me say it again and again, is one of the best preventative measures before your child's issue becomes more serious. If they know that you're supportive and you're open to communicating whatever their issue is, they will come to you and be able to get the help they need through you sooner than if they don't feel like they could be, come to you and be supportive. Don't forget as well that if you are overwhelmed with your child's either anxiety issue or general mental health issue, reach out to people, okay? Reach out to the schools, reach out to mental health professionals in your area, get help as well and be supported yourself. So I know we talked a little bit about school anxiety, school phobias, and these kind of things. I want to talk more specifically about COVID and how some of these things might manifest themselves within your child. Because as you know, the letters are coming home. Things are changing as we go get closer to the school year. Unfortunately, there's no way to really know what direction the school year is going to go because of the nature of COVID and how things are playing out. So together, we're going to try and help our children and our school communities kind of get through this the best way they can. So here are some maybe more COVID-related anxiety points that you might hear from your students or you might be thinking yourself as parents. So a major point I want to make is that some of 
your students or other students in the school may not have entered the high school or middle school buildings uh, since March of 2020. If they were in elementary school when the pandemic started, they might not have stepped foot in the middle school. Some of the freshmen and sophomores in the high school have never even been to the building or seen it. So especially at the beginning of this school year, your student, whether they were a, whether they're a perfect academic student or not, whether they were in person or hybrid last year, they may struggle with things like in-person classrooms, the expectations, the distractions, their own ability to focus, uh, social life, friends, recreation, lunchtime, hobbies, sports, the drama, the daily drama of high school, which has not been as apparent in everybody's physical lives structure and authority. School is a much different entity when it's being conducted virtually through a computer. And the full day schedule is a major change going from waking up in the morning, kind of getting onto your, your Zoom calls and making it through the day. Do you remember whether you, when you return to work or your office, maybe you're still working from home. So when your students come to you with these anxieties, remember how it felt for you to go back to the office or back to school or back to work the first time after COVID started. They're going through the same things. As everybody's you know, very much aware, it created many challenges in our day-to-day -day life. We may not know how our children were affected in, in many years and they, they lost out on critical time to learn, socialize, grow and, and fail and build resilience. Some students are gonna have to, may have to repeat classes, some even whole grade levels, um, some students actually had the best academic performance of their life being remote. Um, so I want you to remember that every single student, your, your students included, all had unique experiences over the last year and a half. And we're all here to work together through whatever the start of this school year is going to be. We know it's, it, it has potential to be hectic and crazy, but that's why we're all meeting together before to, be, to try and limit that and make it a little bit more manageable for everyone. So like I was saying, remember that there are major changes going on with your students return to the school building. So how, to, how you can help is to remember some of the topics that they might be anxious about or discussing. Return to public speaking, uh, the social distancing, masks being required, full day of classes, the rotating schedule, uh, the commute, is a major change if your students are taking the bus and they have to wake up earlier. Um, like I said earlier, communicate, listen, be supportive of the issues your students facing, and you're gonna be able to help them conquer their fear, fears and anxieties as we move into this new normal and begin the school year again. So I know earlier, uh, Ms. Weigert had said, you know, we're doing the depression screening. The depression is something that just like anxiety is probably something that many of our students experienced at some point during the, the pandemic. So it's a mental disorder which affects our emotions, particularly sadness. People suffering from depression may experience feelings of sadness. Typically that sadness lasts for two or more weeks. That is the clinical threshold for clinical depression, a diagnosis, um, a loss of interest in past activities, a loss of energy, fatigue, anger, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, feelings of worthlessness, thoughts of wanting to hurt themselves or kill themselves, or difficulty thinking and making decisions. So the warning signs, you're going to see the symptoms that I showed in the previous slide are severe, and any one of them are going to be, you know, warning signs that there might be things going on with your child or student. But some of the most prominent warning signs are if they're consistently sad for two weeks, if their feelings of interest, in, if they're lost, if they've lost interest in the activities that they do, um, or their feelings of hopelessness. Expressing a desire to die or kill themselves is absolutely a major concern. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. These are just warning signs of you being close to the threshold of clinical depression and, and seeking out a little bit more help. So like I'm saying, like I was just saying, at some point, all of us have experienced the symptoms of depression. Um, you may have had one or two of them. Um, they're very common in 
tons of life experiences like loss and grief. Um, so it's, it's, it's normal. These are normal symptoms to have, but if your child is experiencing the four ones I showed up top here, um, or, and they're depressed for more than two weeks, uh, these are some of the steps that you can take to really kind of help out. Um, communication. Like I said, you're going to he keep hearing me say that. If you sense that something is wrong with your child, ask them. This is an important part about that is fostering the supportive communicative household before there's any issue. So you want to be able to come to your child, ask them a question sincerely and get, get what's going on with them. So they might not tell you right then, um, but you're, you're communicating that you recognize a change and you want to discuss it. It may take them some time to feel comfortable discussing it. They might not even really know what's going on with them, similar with anxiety, until that they are ready to talk to you. But by showing and saying those things, asking questions about how they're feeling, it, it provides them the knowing that you are there for them, okay? Try to avoid phrases such as, get over it, it's not a big deal, you don't have anything to be sad about. Someone suffering from clinical depression or even depressive episodes could be going through major biochemical changes within their brain. Um, there's a lot of science that shows that it's, it's chemically a change in your brain that causes these depressive symptoms and that it's not necessarily within the mental capacity of someone to just switch off you know, depressive thoughts. So telling them to snap out of it or that it's not a big deal is likely not an option for them. Um, if your child is depressed and they could snap out of it, I 100% guarantee you that they would have snapped out of it by now. Uh, it is not a state that they would probably enjoy to continue to be in. Support. So do not try to change or fix, just be present and available. Allow them to come to talk to you or seek support. Utilize the supports that are available. You know, If you have an outside therapist, like Jesse said before, it's always a good idea if you feel like you need it. Consult with your psychiatrist, consider medication. Antidepressants, especially in severe depression are incredibly effective. Um, find support or therapy groups outside of school. Alert the school guidance department if you're seeing changes in your student and you feel like maybe they need to talk to somebody or you need help getting a referral to an outside location. Um, observation, uh, depression's warning signs and symptoms are not always obvious and you know your child best. So look for changes in their mood, their sleep patterns, their eating habits, substance use, and lack of motivation. If your child's exhibiting some of these symptoms of depression, remember, they might not be clinically depressed if they are sad and they're, you know, not eating as much and sleeping a little bit more. They might be sad. They might not be clinically depressed, but they probably still need support. There's probably still something going on that they could use your help for. Suicide is not always an easy topic to talk about, but it's very important, right? Uh, this can be defined by individuals who experience intense and unmanageable psychological distress. They're going to seek out suicide as a way to ease that burden. It was the second leading cause of death for individuals age 15 to 24 from 2016 to 2018. And on the right here, you can see the suicide rates and has, how they've rose over the last, you know, around 20 years. Major risk factors for suicide are a psychiatric diagnosis, any history of substance use, any family history of mental health or suicide, victims of bullying or assault, uh, parental divorce, feelings of isolation, physical or sexual abuse, or lack of social supports and isolation. The signs and concerns of suicide, again, just like depression, they might not be clinically depressed, but they might be having an issue. So exhibiting one of these signs does not mean that someone is automatically suicidal. It does mean that they are at greater risk of an attempt, but if someone's displaying two or more signs, then we should be checking in on that child. If, if a child displays even one of these signs to you, it's, it's instance to be checking in and, and moving it up to a more, a higher level of care if it's not you. Um, but if it's more than two, that's when we need to really be digging deeper and seeing that there might be more severe, serious causes. So if they're making direct or indirect suicidal statements, so I'd rather be dead, I hate myself, or I am going to kill myself, um, verbal or nonverbal, even social media threats, you know, posting on Facebook, 
um, that you're going to jump off a bridge, things like that. Um, previous suicide attempts. So if any individual who's ever attempted suicide remains at a high risk for attempting again, and any person with a previous history, their threat should be taken seriously. Even if it's the fifth time this week, they've told you they're suicidal. It, you want to respond always like it's an emergency in the case that it is. Um, a preoccupation with death and dying, writing essays, songs, art related to death and dying. This one is tricky because some children do have a genuine interest in the topic of death and the way that culture is represented. When I say a preoccupation, I mean everything, all media they consume is related to death and dying, um, all, draw, all art they're doing. If they're genuinely interested in cultural representations, it's a different story, but still something to keep an eye on. Depression, so sudden abrupt changes in personality, expressions of hopelessness or despair, uh, declining grades or academic performance when they were previously doing really well or just maintaining, uh, lack of interest in once enjoyed activities, anger, irritability, aggressiveness, withdrawal from friends and family, and a lack of hygiene. The three major signs of and concerns for suicide I, I highlighted here in depression, expressions of hopelessness, and despair, no, no thinking, no future forward thinking, um, lack of interest in, in enjoyed activities and withdrawing. If somebody's giving out final arrangements, giving away their prized possessions or saying goodbye, they're making their own funeral arrangements. Um, other signs, things like increased alcohol or drug use, recklessness, you know, purposely putting your, yourself in harm in order to die uh, or getting into real serious trouble for, for the first time. If your child is actively trying to kill themselves or has made an attempt and you are with them at that moment, the first thing to do is call 911 and get professional help. Sending your child to a treatment center or for psychiatric evaluation at, a, at an emergency room can be a traumatic experience, and we only want to do so if it's absolutely ne necessary. If you recognize some of the warning signs of suicide and a change in behavior, it may be time to take action. That doesn't mean that as soon as you see it... Uh, consult with someone. Remember, call 911 or get professional help. If your child is actively suicidal or has expressed having those feelings, do not leave them alone until they can be evaluated either at an emergency room or with a psychiatrist. psychiatrist. Um, if they've told you that they are planning to hurt themselves, they should be monitored at all times. Remain calm. If By remaining calm, you're providing a space for your child to open up and discuss their issues. Suicide is not an easy topic. So you gotta be prepared to talk about it. Do not dismiss their feelings. Talking about it will not make them commit suicide about or think or make them think about it more, but avoiding warning signs and discussions about suicide may only make your child feel further isolated. So acknowledge that they're having legitimate feelings, but make it clear that you care about their well being. At the same time, you're gonna be, while you're being supportive, you're calm and you're talking, you're limiting their access to objects that could be used lethally. So there's no, painkillers or medications left out, weapons are locked up or removed from the house, guns are gone, kitchen knives are often something that uh, students will say they've thought about taking. So making sure the, the cutlery is, is being maintained and get them access to mental health professionals. Um, if you're in a crisis, if they're actively trying to kill themselves, call 911, get them to the emergency room to get evaluated. If, if they're not, um, reach out to outpatient therapist, contact guidance department, let us know that they said this thing, they, they told me that they had this thought and that they can, then they can get the help they need. Uh, Mr. Newman, I'm going to jump in because I have a great question here that's relevant yep. to the topic at hand. Sure. Uh, what are suicidal signs for students who are high achieving students? Could they perhaps be different? Um, sometimes they may mask their anxieties and concerns over the pressure to do well in school. Absolutely. So, you know, I know I mentioned academic, um, you know, how they're doing academically as a sign, but all consuming kind of, like you were saying, kind of throwing yourself into work as a way almost to dissociate from whatever is going on. Like really, I'm talking like, as you see up on the screen, almost obsessive kind of academic fervor like really going for it um but for the for the high academic students they, they're probably going to experience a lot of the same symptoms 
they might, their academics might be different. So for instance, if you have, let's say an average student who is feeling suicidal and they might begin to get worse grades, a high, high achieving academic student might feel like one academics are the only thing they're good at. So they'll push harder into it or they feel like um, it's a good distraction. So they might push further. It, it's hard to say. Um, and every individual will kind of have different telltale signs um, of that. I hope that, I hope that kind of answers the, the question. I think we will, I think we're gonna have some time at the end. So I'm just gonna continue on. And if we wanna circle back to that, we absolutely can. I have some summaries of some common disorders we see um, in school systems, OCD, bipolar disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. These will be available on the slides um, in a little bit. Uh, I just wanna get through so we can get to some questions. So thanks for the info. Now what? Uh, we discussed a few common mental health disorders, some symptoms and specific kind of ways to interact with and, and help your, your child with that. Um, next, I wanna just review some strategies that you as parents can use to support your child, as well as some tips for children to use in difficult situations. Um, managing a mental health disorder at each stages of the crisis or at each stage of its manifestation is gonna greatly impact the treatment outcome, and it may prevent your child from experiencing a full-blown mental health crisis or emergency. Uh, we're gonna talk about ways to monitor and help before, during, and after a mental health incident. Remember that mental health incident might be one small acute one-time event, a panic attack, or the incident might be over the span of 10 years, the full development of their mental health issue as it begins to generate. So how to manage your child's mental health disorders. The most important thing is gonna be you. Um, COVID caused a lot of disruptions and we're just getting back to the new normal. But in order for you to best support your child, you need to be in a positive mental state. Um, Self-care for the parents in, in our district is gonna be really important. If you practice mindfulness or meditation, eating properly, a proper work-life balance, avoiding news or social media if you're becoming aggravated with it, um, being realistic about where life is at, setting boundaries and, and limiting technology, you as parents, need to set yourselves up to be in the best state of mind because you are the responsible adults in the room and your child might have more mental health issues at the moment than you. And I'm not, it's not that your issues are not valid or are not um, a concern if you're having your own mental health issue or our own issues in general, but you being present for your child is going to be very important and putting it on to help them through. So before, um, before, they become full-blown issues. Like I said before, creating that open communication, always be talking to and checking in with your child. If you notice they seem down or distant, ask why and ask sincerely. This is going to establish that, you know, um, consistency of open communication. Observation. Have you noticed a change in your child's behavior and their thinking and the emotions they're, they're displaying, displaying? Support. Utilize the resources available. Contact the school if you need assistance in finding treatment before something happens, or you want to find a group for your child who has, you know, school anxiety or school refusal. Um, social context. Recognize that this year, 2021 fall, is going to bring challenges for everyone. Um, your student's mental well-being may be impacted by a number of different scenarios or specific issues that we're not even sure of yet until we return fully to in-person. So remember that not only returning to school, but socially as a society, we're still, you know, kind of going through some changes and there's a lot of things that are happening. During, so if your child is experiencing a mental health emergency, a crisis or a difficult time, speak with your child, communicate and try to understand what they are going through. Talk first to their feelings and emotions. Try to be supportive, help to process those feelings and emotions if, if they're open to that idea and then discuss how to fix the issues. If they're open to this part, mistakes they have made or ways to prevent it in the future, that part of self-reflection is great to do together, um, only if they're open to it. Avoid negative statements. There's nothing to be upset about. You're overreacting. These things you say to your child during their most difficult moments will have the greatest impact. Is that this time that we need to be building them up, not breaking them down. Things like ultimatums, they're gonna remember that and not in a positive way. And uh, you, you wanna be supportive because they, 
this will be an opportunity for growth within your guys' relationship as well. So be there for them, ask questions, check in regularly. If they are been depressed for two weeks, you just, you know, check in once a day, every other day, maybe ask them, how often would you like me to ask these kind of, are these kind of questions too much for you? Uh, listen, don't lecture. If and when your child shares they are struggling, it is not the time to try and change or fix things. It's the time to listen and understand what's going on. Support during a mental health crisis, utilize your supports. Utilize the school supports that are here. Connect to therapists, social workers, psychiatrists, any mental health professional that uh, you're connected to will be important. You as the parents can provide support and love, but the professionals are trained in helping your child to learn how to manage and better manage their, their mental health issue. Um, I know not all parents or all, all people are on board with medication, but be open to it, consider it, um, and any form of treatment that's presented to you. I know there's some stigmas around psychiatric medication, um, but it can be extremely helpful and useful for students to regain their control of their thoughts and emotions. If there's an immediate crisis, like I said before, call 911, report to your local emergency room for psychiatric evaluation. After an issue, continue to communicate, check in with your child, listen sincerely, provide verbal support. If they request privacy and there's no safety concerns, there's no suicidal, they didn't just get back from being evaluated for suicide, grant them some privacy. Remind them you're there and continue to check in during their private time, but just allow them to decompress. Um, support, you're gonna be following up with any and all service providers. Adhere to medication schedules if provided. Attend and schedule therapy so your child has an opportunity to process. If your child cannot get themselves to therapy, it is your responsibility to get them there. That is that. If this incident occurred on the weekend or outside of, the, outside of school, please let the guidance department know you're not required to, but it helps us to provide for your students' needs while they're in the building or provide support for you if you need it. Um, so that kind of brings us to um, the end of the presentation. Um, you know, if you need to contact the school with any questions related to this presentation, the information in it, all um, you have Christine Wegger, the director of school counseling here. Myself, Leela Newman, the high school social worker, and Jesse Bader, the middle school social worker. Those are our direct lines and emails. You're, you're, you're absolutely welcome to, to reach out with questions or concerns or any comments or anything. Um, I also added, we added to the end of this, just a list of a few resources that might be helpful or beneficial. Um, things like the Suicide Hotline, New Jersey Hope Line, um, Mental Health I mean, crisis, crisis, Mobile Crisis Response. Um, but thank you guys all so much. I think we're going to take a little uh, time for questions. Christine? Yeah, so we'll open up for questions while we wait. I just wanted to add as well, too, um, you know, if you have any concerns about your student transitioning back to school, and it may just be as simple as getting them into the building, um, you know, and wanting to give them that opportunity to tour the building prior to school starting because maybe they were remote all year. Reach out to your school. We have plenty of um, support. Uh, service providers, if you feel like your student could benefit from some counseling services, please reach out to either myself or Leland or Jesse um, or your student school counselor. They will be in intermittently over the next two weeks prior to school starting. It could be as simple as just helping them get organized again, um, working on time management, or they could maybe benefit um, and, and utilize some counseling services and we are here to help you in that endeavor. Um, or you might be looking for some referrals outside of school and we have plenty of resources and referrals that we are happy to provide as well too. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We wanna make this as successful of a transition back as possible. And I can say collectively um, for us here as part of this program, the administrative staff, um, our staff members, we are so excited to get our students back full time and have what we are hoping to be um, as normal of a school year as possible. So thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please throw them into the question and answer box and, and we will answer some questions.
don't be shy. <laughs> Um, again, this presentation will be posted on the guidance website, uh, both the recording and a copy of the slides. We do have a presentation on Thursday, uh, which will focus on the universal mental health depression screener, which we will be providing to um, or administering to middle school and high school students that do have consent from their parents. So we'll be discussing in more detail on Thursday what that assessment um, will look like, why we're going to be administering that assessment and the supports that will come out of that assessment as well too. So when we send that reminder home also, we will send um, a copy of this presentation as well too. It looks like I have one question here. Um, what if a child who manifests physical symptoms of anxiety, such as nausea, nausea vomiting, GI issues, um, that would normally be reasons they would get sent home sick? So, you know, what might you do in a case where somebody, you know, manifests these, these symptoms and, and it might cause a phone call home for that student to go home sick? I think if I'm interpreting this correctly, maybe it is a student that struggles with anxiety. What might be some strategies that we could utilize? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, we do carry a lot of stress in our gut. So the first thing we may see with a lot of anxiety um, maybe a lot of GI issues. Um, that could be nausea, that could be diarrhea, that could be vomiting. Um, you know, when we're seeing these things, we don't want to dismiss them. Obviously, you know, in those situations, that's a medical reason why you'd be going home. If we're seeing that and it's being experienced and we can come up with a common trigger for that, right? One of the things I said for school refusal is you always want to know what the root cause is. So for your child, if they're having those and if, you know, you start to see it because it would be you first, right? You would notice that your child's calling home a lot and they're saying, mom, you know, I'm having a lot of stomach issues, dad, I'm having a lot of stomach pain. You know, these are reasons why I don't want to sit in school. It's embarrassing. It's painful. Um, give us a call. You know, I would be totally welcome to sit with that student and figure out, well, when did these stomach aches start? You know, when do you start to experience them the most? Are we seeing them always when you're having, you know, preparing for a presentation or when you're in social studies or when you're in math class? If we can identify what that trigger is, and maybe we don't know what it is beforehand, um, then we can help that student in kind of managing the feelings of anxiety and then hopefully work on reducing those symptoms. Um, you know, if there's a lot of physical symptoms like that, though, as well, we always want them to get checked out by their pediatrician or a doctor, um, but also include us in on that as well, because it may benefit from just having a conversation as simple as, you know, these are some of the symptoms you're experiencing. When are you experiencing them? And maybe is there something that's causing them a little bit so we can start working on reducing some of that anxiety. But we would not want to dismiss the fact that they're having physical symptoms and getting sick. Of course, when your child is sick and they need to come home, it's just if we can work with them and help them with some of the anxiety, we can hopefully reduce some of the physical symptoms as well. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. At what point should a parent be concerned with typical teenage moodiness and wanting to be alone from something more serious? Any suggestions or advice would be appreciated. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, it, it depends on a few different factors. I mean, it, it, has your child always had moody issues? Have they more recently become moody? Have you noticed that while they were on remote learning that it's only started then? If your child is moody, like in a teenage way that they just kind of want a little bit of space, I would offer them that space to a degree. Like you want to set a boundary that you're not going to allow them, you know, in complete entire in entire freedom. But your your teenagers, teenage angst and moodiness is is a way of them trying to understand themselves and differentiate from you in a little bit of way and become an individual. So there needs to be some give and take with, okay, you're just going to be moody today. Like I said earlier, though, some of those depression warning signs. So, okay, they might be in their mood in their room and withdrawn and moody, but I know that they're going to soccer practice later, or I know that they have a group of friends that they always hang out with, or, you know, Ethan has plans to, to go to college or to see a show, always be looking for those future forward thinking ideas. So, if when it stops becoming moodiness and it becomes more of an issue, okay, you're not feeling good, but what about tomorrow? Or what about next week? Do you have plans for, you know, the summer? 
if they can't really tell you, you know, I'm not really thinking that far or, you know, I don't plan on being around for at that point. That's when you can kind of recognize that maybe there's more of an issue going on. Um, another great suggestion I would have, if you notice moodiness in your child, reach out to the guidance department. Perhaps we can meet with them to check in with them as well and just see if there's anything more going on. Um, it's always worth trying. I would also like to add, I think it becomes more of a prominent issue when we're seeing it's not just typical teenage moodiness when it's starting to interfere with behaviors that we were typically seeing. So to go off what Leland was saying, the idea being if they're not just being moody with you and at home and at times where they want to be alone to play video games or text their friends or be on social media and all of a sudden we're seeing them isolating and they're withdrawn, those are more serious. Those are those moments where I would want to question, why don't you want to hang out with your friends anymore? Why don't you want to play sports anymore or engage in extracurriculars? This is different for you. This is a behavior change that's going to start to worry and concern me. And like Leland said, any concerns with that, give us a call because we can reach out to the teachers as well and ask what they're seeing in the classroom. And, you know, we can check in with you. And then we kind of have this team effort of, is this teenage moodiness or is this a more serious problem that we need to be more direct and be more aware of? Great, thank you. All right, I'll give it about one more minute for any um, last minute questions. Just please note, um, I did make an error. Our next presentation or next workshop is actually this Wednesday the 18th, not Thursday. I had referred to Thursday. So it'll be Wednesday the 18th where we will discuss the middle school and high school universal mental health screener. And Mr. Spirito just posted here on the question answer box. So the video to tonight's program um, and the links to this presentation will also be available in the coming days on the road forward link on our district website. Um, and he thank you or thanked uh, both Mr. Newman and Ms. Bader. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. My pleasure. Okay. So I think that's all that we have here. All right, wonderful. Well, we thank everybody for being with us. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Um, and again, if you need anything, please don't hesitate. You can reach out to either myself, uh, Ms. Bader or Mr. Newman. We are here to help you all as we transition back. Have a wonderful night. Jesse and uh, Leland, I know you can't see everybody. I'll let you know once everybody is out just so we can debrief real quick. Okay. Yeah, great job, everybody. We're just uh, getting uh, everybody here uh, closed out. You may also want to stop recording. I don't yep. Know if you yep. That, but...